morning, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> well, <laughs> have you all had a, those that were here yesterday, I hope you had a good sleep and good rest. Because you're in for the long haul again today. <laughs> welcome back and welcome to the, our new visitors today that weren't here today. You're certainly in our for a treat because today we are going to sort of end. Uh, each speaker will take today to another higher level and really end on a climax. And I'm looking forward to each and every one of our speakers here and our guests today. So, um, a very special occasion, Megalithomania, South Africa, Johannesburg, 13th of March, 2011. The conclusion of what we've started of planting the seeds of higher consciousness and, and the expansion of knowledge. So to introduce our first speaker and our guest today, the, as you may have noticed from our program, we've changed the format a little bit, um, to continue his phenomenal research and fabulous information that I absolutely love, um, Hugh Newman about the American, ancient American civilizations, the Olmecs and all the um, cultures associated around those American civilizations. So please put your hand together for the conclusion of Hugh Newman's spectacular work, Hugh Newman. Thank you very much, Michael. Another rousing introduction. So today, rather than talk about just Mesoamerica and uh, the ancient civilizations of that part of the world, we're going to be looking at the entire planet from a geodetic and from an earth grid's perspective and how the ancients worked with these particular energies and with these sites across the entire surface of the globe. This is just the introductory image here, but you can see the comp how complicated these grids can get. And we're focused here on Africa, just to give you some idea. Here's the book which this talk is going to be based on with a bit of extra research thrown in. And you can get this on Amazon and on our megalithomania.co.uk website. Unfortunately, we've sold out here, so you can't get them here, I'm afraid. And here's just, some of, here's just an outline of the contents of this lecture, just to give, get you tuned up uh, to what I'm going to be discussing for the next hour. But what really we're looking at here, as well as this kind of list, is the idea that there, is a, there was a global civilization in, in prehistory who understood where we were on the planet and were able to survey and mark the surface of the planet with ancient sites. For, for whatever reason, we're not sure, but we're going to look at some ideas today. And also, we're going to look really at ley lines, or lays, as Alfred Watkins termed them back in the 1920s, which is simply an alignment of numerous sites over uh, whatever distance you choose. But some of these, it's now been realized, since we've been able to map the planet more carefully, is that some of them go all the way around the planet, and actually are great circles around the entire circumference. We're also, when you look at grids and earth energies and lays, you really have to look at sacred geometry and the platonic solids because the earth is more or less a sphere and some of these grids fit into these principles wholeheartedly. Also, some ancient maps give some clues as well. But first of all, I'd really like to dedicate this to John Michel, who was the inspiration for Megalithomania. He wrote the book called Megalithomania in 1982. And he was one of the visionaries who came up with many of the ideas to do with global earth grids and earth energies and ley lines. And I think this passage from the book, The View Over Atlantis, is an extremely good example of what we're going to be looking at today. So I'm going to read this out word for word to see, uh, just in honor of John Michel. A great scientific instrument lies sprawled over the entire surface of the globe. At some time, perhaps it was over 4,000 years ago, almost every corner of the world was visited by a group of men who came with a particular task to accomplish, with the help of some remarkable power by which they could cut and raise enormous blocks of stone. These men erected vast astronomical instruments, circles of erect pillars, pyramids, underground tunnels, cyclopean alignments, whose course from horizon to horizon was marked by stones, mounds, and earth works. The vast scale of prehistoric engineering is not yet generally recognized. John Michel from The View Over Atlantis, that was published in 1969. And so first of all, let's look at the prehistory of the potential of a global civilization and earth grids. 
The Piri's Res map is a very good example, which was a map from 1513, and it had, it's got many incomprehensible grid lines all over it. And it was, it was put together from many other ancient maps in Alexandria around that time. And Professor Charles Hapgood of Keene State College, New Hampshire, spent seven years working on this and believed because Antarctica was mapped free of ice, that it must be thousands, if not 10,000 years old, because Antarctica was only free of ice back in that era. And so pieces of these old maps were obviously congregated by Admiral Peary's race, and, came, and he came up with this. And also, the Giza alignment, which is like the prime meridian, as Graham Hancock mentioned last night, the prime meridian really shouldn't be going through Greenwich or Paris or anything like that. It should be going through Giza. It should be going through that part of Africa because that's the geodetic center of the planet. And there's another map just below there, Orontius Finicus map from 1532. And this, again, backs up this idea that they were mapping the world in extremely ancient times because it shows clearly the coastline of Antarctica, again, and this again suggests an extremely prehistoric date. There are many more examples than that, uh, which I cover in the book. And now we come to a very interesting creation myth of the Hopi. And this is, this is like uh, fascinating because this goes way back into their prehistory. And it just, this is a graphic interpretation of it, but basically the creator, or Tiawa, assigned spider grandmother woman, which is this lady here, as guardian for the earth. And she spat into two handfuls of earth and two men were created, Polagahoya and Pogagahoya. They sat in meditation to link minds and energy was sent to the north and south, po south poles. They heard a distant slow rhythm from the heartbeat of Tiawa and they started beating on a magical drum to create energetic cymatic geometry out through the planet. This energy hit the navel of the earth and then it shot down to the center of the earth and bounced back to the surface where these power spots or power centers all over the planet formed. And that's what these, and the hope is called this spots of the fawn. You may have heard this, uh, this legendary uh, creation myth before. But first of all, before we sort of start looking at other ancient references to the grid, I think we need just to go off planet for a little while and have a look at Mars. Because a lot of the research carried out, the studies of Mars by Richard Hoagland and other researchers, realized that there were geometries going on, actually aligning certain, what looked like ancient sites and pyramids and the face on Mars, actually on the surface of the planet. And they kept working working away at the geometry, and Richard Hoagland got access to many of these different photos. And he realized the same angle kept popping up between different pyramids, between different structures, and it was always 19.47 degrees, or 19.5 degrees. And he realized that was the geometry, or that was the latitude. If you place a tetrahedron in a sphere, and the points where it touched the surface are 19.5 degrees above or below the equator, depending on which way you put the, the tetrahedron in it. And he noticed that on Mars, the Olympus Mon volcanoes, which are the largest in the solar system, sit exactly at that latitude. So he suggested that maybe points of a tetrahedron were being mapped on the surface of the planet as well. Now this also happens on Earth. We have Hawaii, and the great volcano complex there sits at 19.5 degrees. And also we get examples on other planets too. Dark, there were dark cloud bands around Saturn at 19.5 degrees. And there's the highest solar flare activity on the sun, again, at this latitude. Jupiter's red spot sits at 22.5 degrees, which is exactly a quadrant distance. And the great dark spot on Neptune sits at 22.5 degrees as well. So we, we're noticing correspondences between certain different points. And we'll come back to these as we move along. If we have a look at um, Miranda, which is Uranus's moon, there's some fascinating geometries that are simply on the planet's surface. And you can clearly see hexa hexagonal and pentagonal geometry.